I want you to think of your favorite photo of you with the people closest to you in your lives. This could be a picture of you and your family or you and your friends. Now imagine one day all of them tear you out of that photo. And for the rest of your life, they gather without you, share stories, reminisce, celebrate their achievements without you. They erase you from their memory. How would you feel? Hurt? Confused? Angry? Well, this is largely how the telling of history in cities all across the southern United States, including here, has treated African Americans. At the start of this year, a friend of mine, a black woman, asked me to tell her local history to a leadership group. I was happy to help. As a trained and experienced scholar, I thought it would be easy. I'd check out some books in the library and put together a presentation. How wrong I was. I found a few key bits of information in books, but I discovered that most of our region's black history was hidden, scattered in countless pieces, in library storage, government vaults, state archives, courthouses, and numerous digital databases. I felt like an archeologist that was searching for long lost bits of treasure that had been buried in a cave. When I began presenting our region's black history publicly, I was surprised at how moved people were, both black and white. I expected anger about the past, but I didn't expect shock and gratitude and tears from the audiences. White audience members said things like, I never learned this in school. I never saw this in any museum. I had no idea this happened. And from black audience members, I heard things like, thank you for telling my story. Thank you for helping my voice be heard. Once, an older black woman stood up in the audience and told us how she was the first black student at her high school. And then holding back tears, she also told us how she had not been invited to her school reunions for 50 years. Another time, an elderly black gentleman shook my hand and told me, thank you, you're the first honest white person I've ever met. This is how I learned firsthand the power of historical honesty. So what caused this history to be so hidden? Human nature. To demonstrate, I want you to clap if you've ever told a morally embarrassing story about yourself where you made your actions sound better than they actually were. Yeah, me too. You see, we often rewrite our past to make ourselves look better. And we do this collectively as well. It's called historical denial. A people invent a false history to hide an embarrassing fact about themselves. This happens all around the globe. And in the United States, we have the lost cause of the Confederacy. Let me explain. At the start of the Civil War, Southern whites explained that the reason they were leaving the Union forming the Confederacy and fighting was to keep four million people enslaved based on their skin color. Out of thousands of quotes from Confederate leaders saying this, I'll read just one. Confederate Vice President Alexander Stevens publicly declared, the Negro is not equal to the white man. Slavery, subordination to the superior race is his natural and normal condition. This, our new government, is the first in the history of the world based upon this great physical, philosophical, and moral truth. And for more of Confederates' own words at the time, just read any Southern newspaper from 1860 or early 1861. Yet even before the Civil War ended, Southern whites began erasing and rewriting their history to glorify their actions. They now began to claim that they weren't fighting for slavery, but for liberty. They themselves called this story the lost cause narrative. And in the decades after the Civil War, the Lost Cause narrative expanded to include fictional accounts of the Reconstruction Era and Jim Crow segregation. By 1900, Southern governments had widely banned accurate history textbooks and required that schools teach only the fictional Lost Cause. By the 1920s, Southern governments had widely built Lost Cause monuments. Films like Birth of a Nation actually made the Ku Klux Klan into heroes, and the 1939 film Gone with the Wind romanticized the Confederacy. These and other such films spread the lost cause narrative everywhere. The lost cause was really lost truth. The lost cause narrative affected local beliefs as well. I've heard many myths about our region's history. I'm gonna share just four of them with you. 
along with the matching facts. Myth, slaves were well treated in this area. Fact, enslaved people lived under the constant fear of brutality. Local law required that if you tried to escape, you received 25 lashes of the whip. And if you tried to resist, you could be killed. Agatha Babineau from Lafayette Parish and Gordon from St. Landry Parish told how their owners beat and whipped them and sometimes even rubbed salt in their wound. All this explains why, when Union General Banks came through this region during the Civil War, thousands of enslaved people fled to his forces to be liberated. Myth, there wasn't much slavery in our region. Fact, according to the 1860 census, half the population of Lafayette Parish was enslaved. Half of white households had slaves at an average of over eight slaves per slave-owning household. And a majority of our entire region of South Central Louisiana was enslaved. Even most non-slave-owning whites were heavily dependent on the slave-based economy. Myth, after the Civil War, Reconstruction locally was a nonviolent white struggle against corrupt black government. Fact, Reconstruction was an attempt to create racial equality in the South, but Southern whites blocked that effort through systematic anti-black terrorism, including dozens of murders and assassinations by our local area chapters of the Knights of the White Camellia and the White League. Myth. Jim Crow segregation wasn't so bad around here. Fact, state-imposed segregation was intense, pervasive, and systematic. Besides extensive physical separation, there were extremely few options for blacks when it came to careers or education. They had no political say, and all this was enforced against them by violence when needed. And most cities in our region went even beyond this. Lafayette Parish had several lynchings, the city of Lafayette actually made interracial friendship a crime, and in 1923, the city passed an ordinance dictating only two areas of the city where blacks could live or own a business. In short, in our region, South Central Louisiana, whites of all backgrounds, French, Spanish, English, German, and others, severely oppressed black people. Yet the lost cause hid most of this history. For example, the leading academic book on Lafayette Parish history was published in 1959. Out of nearly 300 pages, it contains only a six-page chapter on black history. Just last month, I visited a museum in our region that had exhibits to local cotton and sugarcane production in the early 1800s. These industries were based on enslaved labor, yet there was not one reference in these exhibits to slavery or anyone of African descent. A Confederate monument in St. Landry Parish was built in the 1920s as part of the Lost Cause movement. This monument also happens to stand at the same location as the Opelousas Massacre, committed by whites against blacks during Reconstruction. It was one of the worst acts of domestic terrorism in U.S. history, yet there is no memorial to the victims. Indeed, we've had no problem remembering Confederate soldiers from our region for the last 150 years. Yet there were also many black soldiers from our region that fought for the Union, such as August Bernard from Lafayette Parish and someone we just met, Gordon from St. Landry Parish. Indeed, a monument in Washington, D.C. even honors our region's black Union veterans by name. Yet locally, we've forgotten they even existed. A mural created in the year 2010 showcases the major white ethnic groups that founded the city of New Iberia. Absent from this mural are enslaved blacks, even though they were a third of the founding population, and over 60% of that population by 1860. The only portrayal of black people is a musical band located in a tiny section of the mural. And this absence is even more profound in our official regional flag, which represents only French and Spanish heritage. This means that in our most common visible representation of our region's heritage, African heritage, a major part of our heritage is invisible. And far beyond questions of accuracy, these symbols have enormous meaning. 
just like family portraits. They reveal who we value or do not value as members of our community. Now, our local historical accuracy is improving, but much of our region's history telling, as you can see, still treats African Americans almost as if they've never existed here. And really, in our region, there is no such thing as black history or white history. There's only our history, a history of deeply interwoven interaction. And so historical accuracy means historical inclusiveness by telling our shared history in schools, museums, books, films, murals, monuments, and cultural tours. Historical honesty is so vital because historical denial is so dangerous. Those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it. And historical denial makes extreme beliefs like white supremacy seem not so bad, especially when it falsely proclaims to promote racial harmony. Just last year at a Lafayette City Council meeting, an older white gentleman defending our local Confederate monument claimed, we've never had a race problem around here. <coughs> historical denial also perpetuates discrimination. The lost cause narrative taught that enslaved blacks were happy and loyal, but free blacks were dumb, lazy, and untrustworthy. So even though slavery had ended, these beliefs led Southern whites to impose yet another hundred years of severe racial oppression. And this happened as recently as your parents' or grandparents' lives, or perhaps your own life. It's not surprising then that we still suffer the lingering effects of this discrimination. As just one of many possible examples, remember that ordinance I mentioned that the city of Lafayette passed in 1923, segregating blacks to only two neighborhoods? That ordinance was a century ago, yet we still see these same residential patterns today in racial maps of the city. Historical denial also marginalizes people. It says you and your experience don't matter. This isn't just wrong, it's foolish, because it hurts everyone. We can't come together to solve our common problems if our shared stories leave out many of us. And how can we move forward together if we can't even admit the past? Honesty is a critical foundation for any relationship, a friendship, business partnership, or marriage. Likewise, to have racial unity we must have racial honesty. Of course, we're not responsible for what our ancestors did, but we are responsible for what we do now. And this marginalization I'm talking about is happening now. So ask yourself, how complete and accurate is your local history? And how can you improve that? Luckily, the answer is really simple. Honest conversation. You could perhaps share what you learned today with at least two people and hopefully many more. If you see a local school or museum is leaving out important history, ask that it be taught. You could write an article or book filling in missing local history, but that's okay. If that's too much, just update a Wikipedia entry. If you see a monument to racial oppression, ask your local officials that it be moved to a museum where the history of that oppression can be told so that it never happens again. And if you see a symbol of your community that leaves out a major portion of your community, ask that that group be included in the symbol. Insist that the invisible be made visible. As a positive example, in 1999, the University of Louisiana improved the historical accuracy of its official seal so that it now reflects our region's French, Spanish, and West African heritage. Now, visibility is only the first step, but it is essential. Being seen is critical to mutual respect and dialogue. Yet I'll warn you, if you tell accurate history, you may have your character attacked by historical deniers. This has happened to me and others I know locally. And this intimidation often succeeds. I've spoken with local leaders, both white and black, who admit privately that the lost cause narrative is false but they're afraid to say so publicly for fear of losing their jobs or social status. No one should be afraid to tell the truth, and it's important that this truth be told. So I'm giving this talk today. Let's end the dangerous lies of the lost cause of the Confederacy. Let's end the dangerous lies of any type of historical denial anywhere. We've adapted to lies. Now let's adapt to truth. And we wouldn't be alone. 
all around the world, numerous groups of people have admitted the truth about past wrongdoing committed by themselves or their ancestors in order to bring, to bring reconciliation between themselves and the people that were hurt. Let's join them in courageously embracing historical honesty, along with what honesty brings, empathy, compassion, understanding, forgiveness, and healing. If we all come together, we can restore everyone to our community portraits. What was torn apart can be made whole. And that's the power. That's the power of historical honesty.